So, hello, Andrew. Hi. Um, I am very happy and honored that I can talk to you today. So I will, for the viewers in Romania, I will read something about you. Uh, Dr. Andrew Agius is the founder and medical director of the Pain Clinic, an uh, integrative medical center for the inter interdisciplinary management of chronic pain. Dr. Agius has been treating patients with chronic pain since April 2015 and he was the first doctor in Malta, Malta to start recommending CBD to his patients and he is now one of Malta's top medical cannabis prescribers. He also started an educational initiative called Kanatalim to help educate patients and professionals on the endocannabinoid system and the therapeutic properties of cannabis. So thank you Andrew and uh, uh, so happy that you could share with us uh, your experience. As I told you when I talked to you um, earlier, uh, for uh, us in Romania, it's very important that um, we have people like you invited and could share with us your, their experience and also the progress that uh, they have made in uh, this battle of uh, legalizing cannabis in the medicinal purposes. So, um, I would like to ask you in the beginning, um, how did you start this um, road on the medical cannabis? Um? Mm -hmm. So, um, I started originally as a family doctor. I mean, my father was a family doctor as well, and uh, we had a group practice together, you know, as a family clinic. And uh, I used to see patients as a family doctor for... 10 to 12 years before I started, um, you know, kind of specializing more on pain management. And during those years as a family doctor, I uh, could see that there were many patients who I was particularly interested in that I couldn't really manage their symptoms very well. You know, uh, patients with uh, this widespread pain, patients with uh, sleep problems, with uh, certain mental health issues, you know, that uh, even though they uh, visited uh, consultants, psychiatrists, um, neurologists, orthopedic, still, you know, they couldn't really manage their symptoms very well. And uh, after uh, about 12 years of working as a family doctor, I uh, it was time for a bit of a change and uh, Pain was always an area that interested me and uh, I got together with a colleague who was a, an anesthetist and a physiotherapist and we came up with this uh, idea of uh, establishing a pain clinic for patients who have uh, symptoms that still haven't been controlled with conventional medication. In the beginning, <clears throat> we used to um, recommend physical exercise, uh, physical therapy, um, mindfulness exercises, meditation, yoga, and all these, um, which many, in many cases, they used to help the patients, but obviously they were very slow, you know, to get uh, results. So patients uh, with pain, they needed something quick and fast, you know. And uh, after about uh, a year or so, uh, when we had started the pain clinic, I had one of my first patients who came, who told me his experience with medical cannabis. He had uh, been involved in an accident with a motorbike and he had severe injuries in his uh, leg because a bus came out of a side street and crushed him on a motorbike. And he had uh, nerve muscle injuries, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, insomnia, and a lot of symptoms which we see, you know, very often associated together. And he explained that even though he spent over a year and a half going to the hospital, getting um, regular medication, antidepressants, sleeping pills, painkillers, these weren't really um, helping him very much. And uh, after about um, a year and a half of trying to get back, you know, his life, he decided that um, he needed a second opinion because he didn't feel that he was making any progress. So he went to Holland 
and over there I, he met a doctor who prescribed medical cannabis in the form of THC containing flowers and he explained how this uh, medicine through the endocannabinoid system helped to restore his uh, homeostatic mechanism and it reduced his pain his anxiety and with one medicine he managed to treat all his symptoms much more effectively than his previous medication and obviously with less side effects because most of the medication were causing him to go crazy he was becoming practically also suicidal at approximately the same time of uh, year it was about uh, june 2016 i was approached by an english doctor in the uk who was practicing integrative medicine and he was um, uh, recommending CBD oil to his patients with fibromyalgia, cancer and the conditions that still haven't responded to medication and he showed me some of his results which seemed to be very positive even though there wasn't any clinical trials and studies he made a small trial and it seemed to have a positive effect and uh, I had a few patients uh, in mind you know who I could maybe recommend this and one of them was this uh, 34 year old lady who I had been her family doctor for about 10 years. She was one of my first patients. I knew her and her family very well. She had a nine year old daughter and she was married, you know. Uh, she had fibromyalgia, OCD, hypothyroid, and a number of other associated conditions. Um, which were not controlled at all. She was uh, on about 20 different pharmaceutical medications a day. She couldn't get out of bed because of her uh, um, fatigue and pain and uh, depression. And uh, I thought that she would be a very good candidate to recommend CBD oil too. So I did a bit of research, found that this oil was available in Malta online and we ordered it and she started this oil and literally within a few hours she noticed that this new drug was having an effect very different from any other medication which she had tried before and uh, slowly slowly she managed to find the right dose for herself and uh, we started tailing down her medication and literally within one to two months she was off all her medication she started losing weight, she started gaining her energy and uh, within um, uh, three to four months then she ended up opening a business. Um, so from not being able to get out of bed, she went, you know, to being completely having a, a very active life. Um, and this was to me a, practically a miraculous transformation because I knew how she was suffering, you know, she, she couldn't even communicate well with her family because of the pills, you know, and the, they had changed her completely. And her family never stopped thanking me, you know, uh, for bringing their daughter back. And uh, it was something quite um, uh, remarkable, her improvement. So obviously that <clears throat> intrigued me to uh, do more research and to see how I can help other patients um, with similar conditions. And very slowly, we, we um, uh, started recommending these uh, drops. And uh, most of the patients who had similar conditions showed similar results. So even though there weren't really any trials or any scientific evidence, it uh, seemed to be quite a safe um, substance to, to recommend. And so we obviously carried on recommending it with very good results. And after about uh, three months of getting, you know, similar results, I decided that, you know, I need to inform the health authorities <clears throat> about this uh, medicine and that it is something that patients need better access to because obviously my clinic was catering for patients who uh, weren't responding to conventional medication. <clears throat> now, this was something that was really helping them. And I needed this tool, you know, to, to be able, and I wanted to be with my mind at rest that I'm not breaking the law, you know, or so I uh, tried to contact them by email and sending one email after the other and um, I didn't get any reply. Um, but then after about six months, I decided to go, you know, and uh, try and see, you know, uh, try and get a meeting with the superintendent of public health. 
and eventually uh, in March 2019, I believe, we got a meeting, no, 2018. Um, we got a meeting with the superintendent and we started um, uh, discussing this uh, issue. And she said, obviously, that th this was an area that there wasn't enough evidence in and that we needed more research before these are approved. So you were uh, talking only about CBD when you had the meeting back then. And you were the only doctor in Malta who was, I don't know, approaching them with this subject? Yes, um, uh, at the time it was not even something that people knew about, you know, I mean, no one knew what CBD was or uh, what it did. And uh, because of, you know, my patients, I was always looking for new ways of helping them, you know, new um, solutions that would be obviously side effect free and they would be able to get symptom relief. So uh, when I uh, told them about these products, they said this is uh, something that is illegal in Malta. You cannot, you know, recommend it. And if you carry on recommending an illegal substance, you will lose your license. And mm -hmm. um, so you need to tell your patients that this is illegal and they need to stop using it. But it was legal for the patients to buy it online, but not legal for you as a doctor to prescribe it. It wasn't legal for the patients to buy it online. They were... It was a grey area and it's still a very grey area, as we know, but in yeah. the Maltese law states, and it still does state, that any extract from cannabis or hemp mm -hmm. is illegal. So CBD oil falls under that category and technically it's still illegal. And in Malta, it is still people who buy CBD oil technically are still breaking the law. Mm -hmm. But um, now it's kind of accepted as a food supplement mm -hmm. and uh, even though it is technically illegal it is tolerated or allowed by the police mm -hmm. um, so at the time it was obviously the beginning of all this and uh, the superintendent cannot tell me you know uh, we will tolerate it I mean if it's illegal it's illegal yeah. so um, uh, I uh, decided that uh, I had to tell my patients, you know, to stop uh, buying it. And uh, at the time, then they also contacted the customs to stop uh, these products from coming through customs. And most of the patients who are using them and who are doing very well ended up without their medicine. And obviously they got very angry and they started uh, talking to the politicians, you know, and to the parliamentary members. And they also approached me to see how, you know, we can kind of raise awareness um, for uh, these products to become more accepted. So what, what we did, we started uh, doing newspaper articles, uh, going on TV, you know, uh, getting patients to talk about how they improved, you know, like I've been in pain for 30 years. I've tried every medicine that, you know, I could get my hands on. I've been to physiotherapy, acupuncture, nothing has worked. And now I'm taking these drops and uh, they made a huge recovery and I'm finally pain free after 30 years. And obviously one story after another um, got uh, the press very excited and the, the um, TV, you know, presenters wanted to know more and uh, very slowly we started to get the politicians interested and uh, luckily our Prime Minister was in favour of uh, medical cannabis and so it wasn't so difficult to uh, push for the legalisation of medical cannabis. Uh, only CBD? Well, I mean, in the beginning we were lobbying for CBD, but uh, when we wanted to make a change in the law, we wanted obviously With the whole this. medical cannabis to be approved. I want to ask you something. When you um, appeared uh, on TV and uh, you gave interviews, you had the support of patients organizations or um, only patients that uh, were using uh, cannabis or CBD. 
or um, I don't know, did you have the involvement of other doctors or was it a battle that you fought only by yourself and from the clinic? It was very much by myself. Uh, in fact, all the doctors were all very much against me. And uh, when I started uh, sharing my results with the, with the doctors, you know, we have this uh, group uh, where we discuss different issues. Mm -hmm. And I decided, you know, um, uh, actually the subject started because, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, I had started this educational initiative this was in 2017, where I started uh, doing uh, an hour talk on a different subject, you know, if it was pain, if it was uh, CBD, for example, or um, schizophrenia, you know, the dangers. And then we came to the fifth session, which was about the use of cannabinoids in cancer. And that was when, you know, uh, all the doctors started uh, protesting and saying, you know, this is a very controversial is issue. Um, patients need to know the truth. You know, there isn't enough evidence. And they reported me to the superintendent of public health, who then contacted me and told me that uh, I need to stop because I am spreading misinformation. And if I carry on, I will lose my license. You know, it was the second time. And uh, this was the time when I was uh, kind of justifying um, what I was going to say. And I showed them a few results of uh, particularly two patients that I had. One of them had a glioblastoma, multiform uh, brain tumor that was given chemotherapy, radiotherapy. And the uh, oncologist told the husband of this patient, you know, she only has a few days to live. Shall we leave her to die in hospital or would you like her to die at home? And the husband took her, he decided to take her home. Um, in the meantime, he did his research, he found a supplier of THC oil, ordered it online and I guided him on how to uh, administer it in the form of suppositories. And this lady lived for another year. Um, it's true that eventually, you know, uh, the cancer took over and uh, she uh, eventually passed away probably for various reasons i mean it could be maybe she wasn't uh, being given the right dose of medicine you know but uh, when she went for the follow-up uh, after uh, six months the oncologist was you know very surprised because he expected her to die six months before so this was one of them and then there was another one who also had stage four um, cancer was spread throughout the body and he, he was uh, having very high tumor markers and this patient also um, bought his own medicine from the internet and started administering it and he gave me access to his blood results which showed the tumor markers coming down you know from over 200 to under 10 and I shared these results in the doctor's chat, you know, I told them that this patient was on uh, chemotherapy, has stage four cancer, he had these uh, tumor markers that are very high, and now he's using this medicine and they are coming practically normal. And they told me, oh, this is rubbish, there isn't enough evidence, this could be probably because he is praying to God a lot, and, you know, a lot of different uh, very stupid comments, in my opinion, but Unfortunately, they, they used it to kind of uh, make fun, you know, that I am just prescribing just like that, you know, because it's a, um, a medicine that cures everything and uh, they, you know, poo pooed it in that way and uh, kind of then I couldn't, you know, uh, carry on the argument because uh, it was all the doctors of Malta against me. <laughs> So, so it's it's very similar to Romania. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. I um, I know what you said because of uh, my mother's experience. I told you my mother was stage four cancer, lung cancer. So I discovered the properties of cannabis because she she could not use any more painkillers because she was uh, losing her kidneys. You know, so I had to stop the usual painkillers and starts uh, administrating cannabis, uh, CBD and THC. And uh, 
I mean, she had a few months given by the doctors and she lived almost five years, four years and a half with lung cancer stage four. Um, and she had um, bone metastasis uh, generalized on the spine and um, uh, on the pelvis and she could not move and she had a lot of lot of pain but she didn't use morphine so that's the reason I started the campaign and what I'm doing in Romania so I admire you very much for uh, your power and your I don't know and the support you gave to the patients because unfortunately in Romania I didn't find doctors, as you say, uh, that would uh, that wanted to support me and give me a feedback. So I was by myself in administrating her, you know, uh, because of the interviews that uh, I don't know. I had interviews with doctors in the United States, Canada, Israel. I read a lot of articles, but it was a lot of responsibility and. Um, what I want to emphasize now talking to you is that I hope that a lot of doctors from Malta and Romania will uh, listen to us and um, understand that from our experience, uh, it's a very painful uh, situation for the patients and his family because they're not only fighting with the disease, they're fighting also to I don't know, to not lose their liberty, to not lose their rights to treat themselves, uh, even though they can see they have like an improvement in their life and in their health. And um, I also believe that when someone uh, says uh, we don't have enough evidence, it's a very superficial way to say it because we have I believe at the present moment a lot of evidence and we didn't have the chance to because of the illegal part of uh, you know situation in Europe mostly we didn't invest in studies that much but we are now generating more and more studies and more and more countries bring evidence to many more diseases so this phrase, we don't have enough evidence, is mostly and sadly given by people that refuse to read or to inform themselves. And I believe that this is a very sad and painful thing for the patients who lose the right to treat themselves or to use a medicine, a natural medicine, that wasn't banned uh, a few years ago, you know, so historically, but this is a political and historical thing that you already know, um, it's not normal for uh, people nowadays uh, that they don't have the right to use it. So what I wanted to say to you is that I appreciate very much what you're doing and I believe that patients in Malta were very lucky that you supported their cause and uh, fought for them and I hope that doctors in Romania will keep on uh, will start to fight also for the, their patients um, alongside the politicians who will uh, hopefully pass the law also in Romania but we need the support of the medical community and it's very important to not talk from my point of view uh, only about Romania, UK, Malta or other countries. We should talk about a global community of doctors and patients who could interchange their uh, experience and help patients from uh, any other country and sharing, uh, I don't know, treatments and experiences to give people a second chance. And we are talking now in this uh, international context of coronavirus. So we uh, need, we can see that we need uh, to uh, gain uh, forces and to be like, I don't know, united in the purpose of helping patients. So sorry for interrupting you, but I wanted to tell you that uh, 
um, I mean, I am proud <laughs> of uh, what you're doing in Malta, and I think that your patients are as well. So, uh, congratulations for everything you did. Thank you. So let's uh, move on. So you, uh, you in the beginning uh, started to convince politicians, and the prime minister, you said, uh, was uh, pro the subject, and uh, then they changed the law. So you have now another law, which uh, stipulates what? So now the law um, uh, states that patients can access medical cannabis preparations <clears throat> from a pharmacy as long as they have uh, an approval from the superintendent of public health, mm -hmm. a control card for narcotic and psychotropic drugs, and a prescription. And so patients, um, uh, it's also important to say that even though we've been uh, now almost uh, over two years, actually, that the law was in place, we only have four preparations of uh, flour, three preparations with high THC and one of them with the THC and CBD in equal concentrations. What uh, do you mean by that for preparations? Like the pharmacy has have the right to prepare it? No, they import it directly from uh, the supplier. So we have the Pedanios okay. brand, which have a sativa with high THC mm -hmm. and an indica with high THC. They come in 10 gram tubs mm -hmm. of flour. And then we have another brand, Bedrocan, which is uh, coming from Holland, that they have the high THC flour and they have Bediol, which has 6% THC and 8% CBD. So only the pharmacies uh, could import it or through the Ministry of Health? No, only the, um, the supplier, the, the agent uh, usually imports it from uh, the supplier in Holland or in Germany and then distributes it to the pharmacies in Malta. And the supplier is connected to the Ministry of Health? I want to understand how it works. Oh, no, the supplier um, overseas would need to have a product that is EU GMP. They're very, very, very strict about the type of medicines that are allowed in our pharmacies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for over a year and a half, many pharmaceutical wholesalers in Malta have been trying to approve medicines such as extracts, you know, drops and capsules, but none of these preparations that are available in the Europe and the European Union are fit enough to be approved by the Maltese Medicines Authority. They are very, very strict. But since the raw flour doesn't have any um, much uh, processing, mm -hmm. Um, so most of the flowers that are produced in a GMP facility, like Bedrocan, you know, they're one of the first GMP products, um, were accepted and have been accepted since then. But they're very, very strict. And that is why we only have, you know, these preparations till now, because of the conditions that the Malta Medicines Authority need to accept. So once the pharmaceutical supplier, wholesaler in Malta, um, finds a product over abroad and they contact the medicines authority, they give them the details, they apply, it's a very long application. And then after the medicines authority, you know, make all the checks that they need, they accept it and now it is approved as a medicine in Malta. You don't have the right to cultivate and extract in Malta? No, not yet. But we also have a second law mm -hmm. that was, uh, that came out later that now allows companies to process cannabis in Malta. So uh, there are some uh, companies that have the right to grow for research and development. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some others who import uh, flour or crude oil, process it and produce medicines in Malta to export to Europe. And that is something else that's taking place in Malta. And people are uh, buying from pharmacies only flowers uh, at the present moment. And they use it for their treatment. Uh, how? As uh, they, ex they use it as, I don't know, they mix it with oil or how? how is the process? So mainly they vaporize it. They vaporize it, okay. Uh, 
So they put it in a herb vaporizer and they inhale it. But the smoking is forbidden, is only vaporizing, yeah? Forbidden, yes, you cannot roll it in a joint and smoke it. It's okay. not medically recommended, but it is recommended to heat it and inhale it in a vaporizer. And uh, if they want to use, because most of the countries use it as an oil, as you know already, and if people want to buy oil and administrate themselves oil, it's illegal or uh, they could just yes. mix it. Uh, it's illegal. It's you illegal, can, but obviously... You can do it uh, by yourself. Um, uh, CBD is accepted, yeah. you know. I mean, okay. we have a lot of CBD in Malta and people access it, no problem. Okay. When patients come to me, like um, <clears throat> maybe old patients, you know, who cannot smoke or patients yeah. with conditions and they need uh, oils or uh, some other preparations, there are people in Malta who are doing it illegally. Yeah. They're producing medicines illegally. And if I find, you know, that uh, they can benefit, I will guide them uh, on how to access this uh, illegal medicine in a safe way, which is uh, unfortunate, but that's the situation that we're in at yeah. the moment. But tell me, um, the politicians seeing that uh, the medicine uh, is effective for some patients, and I believe a lot of patients, uh, they are open to find new solutions now in Malta to provide uh, people uh, new ways of, uh, I don't know, of cannabis, like oil, like creams, like, or not. You're discussing about yes, this well. they're open, you know, and now over the next, I mean, it was meant to be around June of uh, 2020, but obviously yeah. uh, everything has postponed, but uh, within the next one to two years, we're going to have factories in Malta mm -hmm. producing medicines that are uh, EU GMP grade. And those will be of good enough standards to be available in the pharmacies. I wanted to ask you, in the law that you have now in Malta, are there uh, specifically uh, written the diseases that uh, would benefit from the treatment? Or is it like uh, given the authority only to the doctor, to the prescribing doctor to decide? So, conditions are that uh, the patient has to have a chronic medical condition, mm -hmm. any chronic medical condition. Okay. Um, which obviously makes sense to prescribe cannabis, mm -hmm. such as chronic pain, chronic uh, depression, anxiety, insomnia. The patient would have need to have tried at least one medication. Mm -hmm. So if you have chronic pain and you take paracetamol every day, yeah. or pain, then you are eligible. Okay. Um, and then there are some excluding criteria, you know, like one of them is, if the patient uh, has a history of drug abuse and he would have attended a detoxification program for heroin, then those are automatically excluded. They cannot apply uh, because they fear that they might abuse the medicine, you know. Okay. Um, and uh, it is also not recommended to prescribe to patients who are driving as a living because of the effect yeah. on driving. But then it's up to the doctor to decide, except for the um, drug history, uh, people who have abused drugs and who have been to a detox program, there isn't really anything that excludes patients from accessing the medicine, as long as they have a chronic medical condition and they would have tried the medication. So now you, uh, it's also legal to prescribe to cancer patients as well? Yes. So, um, what about your uh, the medical community now, which was reluctant in the beginning, and uh, now the oncologists in Malta are prescribing to the patients? No. They just tell them. They, uh, for patients who talk to their oncologists about cannabis, some of them say, no, 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 there's no evidence, it doesn't work, it can make you worse, or something like that. Or else those that uh, approve it, they just refer them to me, you know. They tell me there's a doctor who is uh, specialized in this area and you can go to him. And uh, in most cases, you know, we work together with the oncologists and some of them, you know, they 
they're okay with it, you know, and they uh, acknowledge that it can have, especially in palliative um, uh, care, you know, it, it is very useful, you know, for the side effects of chemotherapy, for pain that's not responsive to morphine. I mean, there is an indication for it. Um, but obviously, it, it, it's still very limited because uh, patients who are end stage don't all cannot always vaporize, you know, and yeah, it's not easy. So, um, are there any other doctors in Malta apart to you? So, is now the um, some the medical community interested in uh, developing this uh, experience? I don't know trainings. Uh, I don't know to specialize in cannabis or not. You. Because if not, you have a lot of responsibility, a lot of patients that uh, uh, call you and ask for your advice. So obviously, I mean, since it's been now two years and uh, more patients are accessing the medicine and going back to their doctors and telling them, wow, you know, I've never had such a good medicine. All my symptoms are now gone, you know, and obviously the feedback is coming back and even though they say how can it be there is no evidence and you know all these people are doing so well and so obviously doctors are now getting interested and doctors are prescribing and they're getting good feedback and they carry on so those that are that try to prescribe will probably continue prescribing um, a limited amount of uh, prescriptions because there is also the fact that to prescribe, the doctor needs to take full responsibility of the patient's use of the medicine. We have this uh, very long application form, which puts a lot of responsibility on the doctor. Mm -hmm. And not every doctor is One. ready to take that responsibility, especially if they're not sure, you know, of the possible side effects or complications, interactions. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, very, very slowly more doctors are being interested and uh, are prescribing. Um, with regards to the education, I mean, uh, I've been trying, you know, for the last two years at least. Um, it's not always uh, an area that uh, doctors are very interested in. I mean, the, the few educational talks that we had, maybe there were two to three doctors, you know, maximum who, who showed interest. But hopefully this will change, you know, and once we have also medicines that uh, we can prescribe in a fixed dose, yeah. because uh, prescribing flour, you know, you cannot tell them, you know, take one inhalation three times a day. I mean, how much do you take? How much do you put? How much do you inhale? You know, it's it's not easy, um, and you have THC, you also have the other cannabinoids, it's a full plant extract, so you have the dosage issue, you have the, the actual therapeutic substance, you know, uh, that's not just one substance, it's many, mm -hmm. and you have the issue that some patients cannot administer it, you know, most of the patients that need it are those that cannot vaporize because they're the elderly, they're the ones with chronic conditions. So I think that once we have, for example, drops or capsules with a fixed dose of cannabinoids, it will be much easier for doctors to prescribe them, you know, and to recommend them to patients and to be able to um, give, you know, a, a dose and to be able to monitor them according to the dose that they're being administered. So I think over the next 12 months, more doctors will come on board. Hopefully. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, so at the present moment, as I understand, it's not an obligation uh, for the Ministry of Health to provide courses, trainings for the doctors. So every doctor um, has the right to prescribe cannabis if he wants to accept the responsibility of the patient that he will administrate cannabis, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, and do you have, since two years ago, um, I believe you have some experience in Malta, so uh, about not only the patient's um, improvements in health, but about all the legal aspects, because uh, we can always hear also in Romania the fear of um, 
growing the traffic, uh, you know, the black markets, uh, the fear of, uh, I don't know, um, helping and supporting the people that are addictive, you know, that want to use cannabis in recreational purposes. And um, the crimes that uh, will start and a lot of things that, uh, you know, are fears from all over the world. So I'm interested in... Uh, in knowing after two years of experiencing uh, prescribed cannabis in Malta, any of these situations happened? I mean, uh, the crimes, uh, the black market, uh, what happened there with this uh, subject? Well, Do you know I think something? the biggest change is uh, people are using less pharmaceutical medication, but okay. uh, there has not been an increase in crime. Okay. Um, I mean, possibly accidents. those accidents, I mean, uh, usually patients who use cannabis as a medicine are not at an increased risk of a motor vehicle accident mm -hmm. than patients who are using benzodiazepines, you know, other painkillers such as codeine, morphine, yeah. antidepressants. The intoxicating effect on driving is as a rule, much worse with pharmaceutical medication than with cannabis because cannabis, yes, it can impair your reflex time, you know, it can impair your ability to drive. But uh, once a patient is using it medicinally mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they're used to the effect and that this is something that I always say, you know, when you start it, you need to start it at home with a low dose and uh, for the first two weeks, there is no going driving after using the medicine until you're 100% sure, you know, that, you know, it's not uh, causing any intoxicating effects. So as such, um, it is much safer as a medicine than other, you know, uh, medicines that are used for similar complaints. So uh, um, in your opinion, you believe that the natural plant is more effective and also, I don't know, um, it's better for the health of the patient than the synthetic product? Or what about the synthetic products made from cannabis? This is what I'm asking you. Because, you know, some countries also um, approved the using of uh, medicines based on cannabis pills not the actual plant. So there is a de debate also in Romania about this. And um, personally, I'm, uh, I believe that the natural medicine is... Uh, and also I talked to some doctors in UK and Mike Barnes, maybe you heard about him. He has the same opinion. Of course, it's more, more uh, easier to administrate a synthetic product, but the natural plants... Uh, could probably have improvements better in the health of the patients, in my opinion, but I'm not a doctor. So I wanted to ask you your opinion and also your government's opinion related to synthetic products made from cannabis. So the law allows natural and synthetic products to be okay. prescribed as long as they are EU GMP, you know, and they've okay. been approved by the Medicines Authority. Now, with regard, with the difference is that uh, usually when one does clinical trials, mm -hmm. one investigates THC, CBD, you know, a single molecule medicine. Yeah. So then you find that, for example, CBD was uh, used in a study, and we know that in epilepsy, for example, there is good evidence that in certain conditions, it is a good medicine, just CBD alone. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, medicines, synthetic medicines with just CBD have been produced, even natural medicines, yeah. and these are being used with good effect. The difference between the natural medicine, when especially it is a full plant extract, you get not just CBD, yeah. but you get CBG, CBN, a bit of THC, CBC, and all the other cannabinoids and terpenoids and flavonoids that together with this, the, the actual therapeutic substance uh, in the highest concentration, for example, CBD oil, mm -hmm. if it is a full plant extract, it will be more effective 
for the symptoms that the patient is trying to treat because of the entourage effect, the synergistic effect of the medicine. And that is something that I see every day in my practice. I have uh, specifically looked out and done a bit of observational research on patients, especially with chronic pain, giving them, um, for example, CBD oils that are distillates that have a very limited um, amount of uh, other cannabinoids and other CBDs that are full plant extracts that have very low concentrations of other cannabinoids. And the effect which I share also with other clinicians, which I met um, uh, over the last few months, uh, they all give the same feedback that full plant extracts work much better than uh, single molecule and synthetic compounds. But obviously the pharmaceutical um, department pushes for the synthetic and the single molecule because they are backed by studies. Yes, it's yeah. a plus. But um, even though there is enough scientific evidence that CBD is a single molecule, works for epilepsy. In practice, when you give up um, uh, CBD with other um, uh, therapeutic substances in the entourage effect, you get a better effect overall. So, and obviously you cannot recommend a medicine that you don't really know, you know, what is the therapeutic substance in it. We know that full plant, cannab full plant, full spectrum cannabis works better, but we don't really know why. What are the cannabinoids that are producing this effect? You know, like in cancer. There's so example, many, like uh, more so than three thousand. Hundreds, you know, hundreds, of, of, yeah. of cannabinoids, and there are um, also hundreds of terpenoids and yeah. flavonoids. You know, so um, the whole entourage effect. Give because you mentioned the entourage effect, I know, uh, and also about the studies of Ethan Russo on entourage effect. But could you explain to our viewers uh, the entourage effect? Because uh, not everyone understands what it means, even though you explained. So let's take, for example, THC. THC yeah. is, uh, there is uh, scientific evidence, there are clinical studies that THC is effective in chronic pain, chronic neuropathic nerve pain. Um, now, when you administer THC as a single molecule, for example, dronabinol mm -hmm. produced in a lab, and you administer dronabinol to a patient with chronic pain, for example, who has 10 on 10 pain. And with dronabinol, the pain goes down to 6 on 10, for example. Um, if you administer THC that is coming from a full spectrum extract like bedrocan, for example, bedrocan has mostly THC, but it also has the terpenoids, the flavonoids, and the other minor cannabinoids together with THC, which are in very small concentrations. So they're not even listed as a therapeutic substance, but they are there. And uh, with the same patient, if you give THC from a full spectrum, it will go down to, for example, three on 10 rather than six on 10. So when you compare full spectrum against single molecule, you get a better effect from the full spectrum because of the other small therapeutic compounds that are adding to the effect of THC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I, I hope that everyone understood now uh, why is it so important. I wanted to ask you in the end, of course, if you want to mention something else, because everything uh, that uh, you shared with us was very interesting. And maybe we will have the chance to have another uh, discussion, I don't know, after a few months, after the coronavirus crisis, and we'll get back to cannabis situation in our countries. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have like an advice or, I don't know, something to share with the doctors in Romania and also with the politicians, because you also have the experience in talking and convincing politicians in Malta. So maybe you could also, um, I don't know, share from their experience after introducing cannabis to the politicians in my country, <laughs> which are uh, seeing the video now. And mostly, I want also to, uh, if you can, 
you already said a lot of uh, good things from a, a patient perspective, but I'm afraid that um, some of them in my country, because uh, probably they don't have easily access to, I don't know, studies, they don't read easily in English, we didn't have studies made in Romania until now, they only uh, have the medical perspective of someone who says that it's a bad medicine, uh, it could be addictive, uh, they could have problems, worse problems with their health situation. And I'm seeing a lot of people that deny themselves the treatment because of the fear. So I want, um, I want you, if you can, to to say something for uh, the, uh, all the, um, these categories, doctors, patients, uh, and politicians, um, from your perspective and from your experience in your country, and hopefully we could together change some other mentalities. So with, for, for the doctors, I think uh, the place where one would need to start would be to look into the scientific evidence that actually exists when it comes to using cannabinoids in, uh, in practice, you know, in medicine. Um, there is a lot of evidence, uh, clinical trials, you know, of uh, very strong clinical trials um, in chronic pain. So one in five in Europe suffer from chronic pain, adults, um, so it's a very common condition um, and cannabis is very effective in these patients even though there haven't been enough uh, clinical trials with uh, chronic non-cancer pain. Um, observational data shows us clearly, um, in my experience at least, over 90% respond extremely well to cannabis with no side effects and it is an alternative to opiates and NSAIDs which are both not recommended for long-term use and as we know both can cause very severe side effects to other organs in the body while cannabis can give positive side effects to other parts of the body. I mean I have patients who I prescribe cannabis for pain to uh, that come back and tell me, yes, I've had side effects, um, I don't have asthma anymore, my eczema has healed, I'm sleeping, and I'm not fighting with my husband anymore, you know, and all these are very real positive side effects of using medical cannabis. Um, obviously, there is that 1% risk, um, uh, we know that as a general uh, population, 1% is predisposed to developing a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. For these patients, we need to screen if there's a family history or if there's any risk. And obviously we do not prescribe THC to these patients, but we can still prescribe CBD. CBD is an antipsychotic and it's actually used as a treatment for schizophrenia as an alternative to antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. It's extremely safe. So I mean, doing a bit of reading about CBD one can see that it is something that can easily be recommended in low doses in conjunction also with other medication because at low doses there is very little interaction and the response to certain symptoms is very good you know and uh, patients will have another alternative to their medication and doctors will have another tool very very useful tool to be able to offer their patients mm -hmm. and once you have a tool you know, like this, it is something that uh, your patients will appreciate. And once doctors start recommending it, um, they will alone see, you know, the positive effects that it's uh, giving their patients. And they will like it, ha like, hap like what happened to me, you know, when I saw this young lady who couldn't get out of bed, almost miraculously, all of a sudden losing 30 kilos, stopping all her medication, blood tests with all the hormone imbalances all come back to normal and she opens a business. I mean, this is something, you know, that no other medicine that I've ever prescribed has this effect. Um, so 
anyone can really, you know, prescribe this because it's extremely safe, extremely well tolerated, especially in high doses, except obviously with THC, one would need to be cautious because high doses can cause an unpleasant experience. But otherwise, if used responsibly, it is a very useful tool for doctors. Um, uh, with regards to the politicians, I mean, uh, they would need to see what other countries did, you know, before them and how they went about it. Obviously, it's not easy to find a balance between uh, having cannabis available for patients and protecting protecting public health from uh, the abuse of THC. <laughs> and so I think in Malta, we did quite a good uh, job, you know, by having regular follow-ups. Mm -hmm. We have the first one after 30 days, and then every six months, the patient needs to visit the doctor, you know, to get a follow-up of how they're doing, any side effects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so definitely regular follow-up is necessary. And uh, obviously having medicines that are of good quality so that patients can be safeguarded and, you know, they would be comfortable using their medicine. But um, I think um, seeing what other countries like Germany, the UK, Malta, Italy, France, you know, all these countries have a very good system going where medical cannabis is available for patients. And obviously patients... Um, who are going to their doctor and their doctor is telling them, you know, this is bad, you're going to get worse, you're going to end up uh, in a mental hospital if you... These are very, very common uh, things which uh, doctors say. And they need to do their own research as well, you know, and look, see online, see what other patients have said, you know, if they're suffering from pain, there are groups of patients with fibromyalgia who do extremely well, Patients with cancer, you know, do extremely well, especially for palliative care. So patients need to do their own research and, you know, question their doctors and perhaps get a second opinion from someone, you know, who can give them uh, good advice on, you know, what options they have. Thank you very much, Andrew, for everything. And uh... I uh, wish you have the force and the strength to continue your fight in Malta and also to, I don't know, to convince some other doctors there to uh, support you and the patients in uh, Malta. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other in Romania or because uh, I planned a conference before the coronavirus uh, com started. Uh, and we hope we will have this conference in Romania uh, with the support of the Romanian parliament. Um, we wanted to invite people to share their uh, experiences and doctors and professionals and uh, from uh, countries like you. And uh, I hope that we will benefit as well from your experience in Romania. So maybe we will keep in contact. Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck with all your work. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.